Tenemos ahora la presentación del señor Mike McKinley con una visión global de la regulación de olores en América del Norte. Me gustaría también hacerles una reseña de él. Probablemente muchos lo conozcan. Él pertenece a la empresa San Croix Sensory. Es miembro del comité ASTM E18 sobre evaluación sensorial. Además, entre muchas otras cosas, ha participado en numerosas conferencias internacionales, siendo un miembro destacado de la Water Environmental Federation, en el grupo dedicado a los olores. La verdad es que Mike creció en, en el mundo de los olores. Su familia, su padre, fundó esta empresa. Y el negocio familiar comenzó ya hace 33 años. Mike, por favor. I have to speak English. I've been, I've been learning Spanish very slowly, so I know me llamo Mike. <laughs> Good enough. Soy de Minnesota. Um, and uh, tengo dos hijos con, uh, con trece, two. So, but, but thank you for the warm reception for my first visit to Chile. I've been enjoying every moment of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning to present today, um, not what I'm telling you is the way to do it. I'm only presenting historically what is the way it's done in the U.S. Um, and I'll, I'll mention some of Canada also, not to leave them out in the North American perspective. But it begins with the U.S. EPA and the fact that the U.S. EPA does not recognize odor as a pollutant. And the U.S. EPA has always left it to states, to the individual U.S. states, to deal with odors on their own. So I, I have some history I will try to go through quite rapidly. Nobody likes to sit through a lot of boring history. And it starts in 1970. Seems like a long time ago, but not much has changed in the attitudes um, and the approach in the U.S., for better or for worse. Um, but in 1970, the U.S. Public Health Service, which later became the EPA, um, conducted the first study looking at the national odor problem and looking at odors. They initially started looking at seven cities around the, con the, the, the country. Um, they looked at public surveys and also looked at um, two measurement methods at that time. And at that time, dynamic olfactometry was, was, was in its much infancy at that point. Um, so centometers or field olfactometry was looked at and also the odor judgment panels. The finding then was that um, most agencies went out and just observed um, would, would deal with things from a common sense perspective. And if a company was making a smell, they would try to sit down and persuade that company to be a good neighbor. And few areas had, had put down substantial fines. The public survey um, was, was pretty much as expected, that many people thought odors were a problem. Um, they didn't know who was really responsible for dealing with them. Um, And, and they, of course, thought it affected their well-being and their home cost and things like that. Um, the results of that, from a technical standpoint, were that they wanted to take forward the looking at the centometry, field olfactometry methodology, and also the odor judgment panels. The field olfactometry methodology had been around at this point for about 10 years and involved what's called a dilution to threshold measurement method and being measured dynamically but sniffing in the ambient air and has a, a uh, dilution to threshold ratio as in laboratory olfactometry. So as you sniff through the sniffing port at one end of the device, air is going to go through carbon filters and also you're sucking in air from the outside air to create the dilution at your nose. So this is the centometer from 1960. And in, in this technology, you, you, you put one glass tube in each nostril. And as you sniffed through, most of the air went through carbon filters. And then some outside air came through the orifices. 
You can see that angle. Los hombres are gone. There, there were some men here. <laughs> the judgment panel, which was several people standing here, were sniffing downwind of a source. So going out as an odor jury, so to speak, and making an observation as a group. So in the second study that was conducted a year later, they wanted to look more in depth at um, public attitudes, but also wanted to look strongly at these um, um, technical, um, technical aspects. So in this, they continued to find that the public had what attitudes you would expect. Um, they found the field effectometry to be an effective and sensitive device, but they saw some logistical challenges in using the odor judgment panels. So they then moved forward to a third study, which then looked at trying to develop a common odor ordinance for the country. So in that, they looked at four agencies in the U.S. as a representative sampling, and then wanted to look at this potential odor ordinance. So back in 1972, they chose these four areas in different parts of the United States and wanted to work with them at could a, a model ordinance be developed. However, they found one of the issues, so in that process they found doing public surveys, one of the biggest challenges was when you have some of these odors in sparsely populated areas, you didn't really get great information, especially when you look at agricultural odors in the U.S. A, a two-mile radius is only going to be a small number of people. And, and from a statistical standpoint and from where their perspective comes from, it doesn't give you necessarily a clear picture of what was happening. Uh, they continued to find the odor judgment panels weren't very effective from a routine standpoint. It was going to be hard to gather people together on short notice to go out and make an investigation as a group. And there was also concern with um, if, 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 if citizens or residents were part of that judgment panel, would you then be able to get them to come in in a court setting and, and stand behind the judgments that they made and not have fears and that sort of thing? So they looked forward and said that looking at the methodologies they were looking at, it would apply in the vast majority of cases. One of the biggest problems, though, because of how the United States was founded, you have many different um, judicial systems and perspectives of how they handle the legal system, whether it be New Orleans, um, Louisiana area, versus with, with parishes and the, where, the way their government is organized versus commonwealths more common in the Northeast. Just different ways that these are managed and handled in a court situation. So the nuisance, from a nuisance standpoint, there was some fears of trying to develop something that would stand up and hold in each of those different areas. So where they finally came into recommendations was that surveillance was very important, that complaints alone shouldn't be the determining factor. Um, that any time there's complaints or investigation, that multiple people should go out and do that. Um, the field effectometry at that time being the primary method of recommendation. Um, and then stack sampling, which was, was happening um, at that point in the U.S., much of it without dynamic effectometry at that point, but still there was, dynam or there was static odor source evaluation. So basic elements of an order, um, ordinance were then highlighted as, obviously, you have to have prohibition. You have to say that you can't create an odor in some sense, um, having some choices in how to determine that nuisance. Um, one of the biggest issues often seen in the U.S. is right of entry, uh, a, a government agency uh, having the ability, especially if it's a you know short-term um, uh, instance of an odor being able to get entry to the facility to address that on site. 
um, and then having some enforcement penalty and pushing towards, towards remedy. So currently in the U.S., these states in black are 10 states that utilize the field olfactometry methodology. The gray states also have other forms, fairly vague, basic um, odor regulation. Two states actively regulate odor. Those are Colorado and Missouri. In Missouri, as a specific example, they do take things separately. And, and I, I want to state that the, the European methodology, the EN 13725 of, of source sampling, is alive and well in the U.S. It's just not part of regulatory frameworks from an enforcement point of view. But in Missouri, as an example, if a facility has been found to have violations found by field olfactometry, the state then works with the facility to move forward. And when that facility moves forward to improve odors, the natural next steps are source measurement using EN 13725. And the state of Missouri has stated that and, and does also view that standard of, of olfactometry as the, the international standard. So, so I also wanted to be clear that EN 13725 is in use, but from a regulatory standpoint, has not been brought in in, in a very strict format. Colorado's example um, in theirs with field olfactometry, they have a limit of seven dilutions. Okay, And so this is a story from late in 2013, um, when the news kind of blew up because the city of Denver, the state of Colorado, was legalizing marijuana starting 2014. So what happened in late 2013, as grow houses were being allowed to start growing marijuana in a legal fashion, citizens began to complain of the smells of drying marijuana and processing of marijuana. So now here's, it's funny, it is, and we. Jo I joked with my father that we can market all we want, but you talk about marijuana and everybody listened and, and was really interested in odor all of a sudden. Um, but uh, what, what the city of Denver did, they were getting many, many complaints from citizens. So they went to their regulatory methodology, they went out with our nasal ranger field olfactometer, and they were doing measurements around these grow houses trying to find out, are these going to violate their already existing nuisance law for odor. And they went out, and in most of the cases, they measured two or less, some cases four, but never did they have a measurement of seven or higher. So then the report came back and said, you know, we're we, we not seeing this as a, as a nuisance odor. Now, the city of Denver has talked about should they make it a lower limit because of this issue, but, but this is their approach that they've gone about. So what other states can do is some states have zoning powers that they can set up nuisance ordinances and they can enforce nuisance ordinances. Um, so I'll quickly hear that, you know, a state um, has to harmonize with permitting. So if a facility is already permitted by the state, a city that wanted to do an order, order ordinance would have to use caution in how they develop that, that it wouldn't conflict with an already existing permit. And often they blend it and make it similar to many cities have noise ordinances already. So they, they work to blend it in with there. Um, I wanna give this example as I try to speed to the end. City of Des Moines had, his, had an odor regulation in for, for quite a long period of time that has been actually quite successful. It starts with complaints. And so when complaints come in, in a 24-hour period, an inspector is then sent out to investigate. If the inspector finds that there's a violation, it's recorded. And if they have three of those in a three-month period, then the facility is considered a significant odor generator. What the city of Des Moines has is the city council appoints an odor board. So there's a group of citizens that are appointed like a planning commission, um, that are there and now the company has to come in and meet with the odor board and present an odor management plan of how they will reduce odors with citizen input to this process. And the odor board is an in-between to help stand for citizen 
values and rights of what the citizens want, but also understand monetary constraints and other elements that the, that the uh, company has to deal with. And so the city of Des Moines, through this process, was able to reduce the odors of many long-standing rendering facilities that were, that were causing strong odors. A very important point that we've seen in the United States is technical infrastructure is as important as administrative infrastructure. And all too often when cities try to put in an odor ordinance, there's a lot of the administrative side of this is how it's going to work. But unfortunately, not a lot of time is spent on teaching those who have to do that how odors are measured, what it all means, and how they can go about their job. So there's there's a lack on the technical side of things that that needs to change. So quick summary of the U.S. is no federal. Um, I, I of course wanted to acknowledge my Canadian friends to the north. Um, there's similarly no federal regulation. Um, Ontario and Quebec have the most intensive from an odor regulatory standpoint, mostly on the permitting side um, and with olfactometry built into that. Um, Manitoba does work with ambient measurement and then other, other provinces also use a combination of ambient screening and also the source sampling methodologies. So, and there's a few here from Canada today that could help with questions that you can see me and I can direct you for further questions there. That's my complete. Okay, this, my question is the following. Uh, do you agree with uh, things like, uh, we, we were talking about this yesterday, and, uh, and um, some people might believe that uh, uh, mm, the, the facts that you expose are actually uh, my belief that uh, you are you, you believe in this in these facts uh, in th this way of regulating others, but what would you be, what would it be for you the best way of uh, regulating others in the environment? It does depend, and it does depend on the the governmental setup in the U.S. Ultimately, judges and in some case when it applies a jury tend to believe or, or, or want a measurement from where a person was complaining. They want to know what was going on at the spot of complaint. Um, so from a nuisance where people are complaining standpoint in the U.S., that continues to be, and I don't think will change for a very, very long time, that continues to be its basis. Um, so I think it comes down to, but, 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 and from that standpoint also, cities often don't have the powers to bust down doors and, and, and make a facility go collect samples right in an immediate point in time. But the complaints in the field investigation have to document and prove a complaint or nuisance was in place at that time. But then in order to do any corrective action, you have to then switch over and the facility has to address the source measurement side of the picture. And they then need to take source samples. Now, if a facility, if a country or, or state for that matter had many of the same industries, okay, so let's say there were many rendering facilities or many piggeries, they could potentially then move towards a source limit where it would be the measure, source measurement and dynamical effectometry. And, and I know of a few instances where after nuisance was proven, was shown by field investigation as part of the negotiated moving forward, facilities then did agree to um, stack emission limits as part of a city agreement or legal agreement. So I know that doesn't completely answer your question, but I think it does depend on governmental structure, um, community attitude and approach, and whether the field methodology will apply or the um, 
source sampling will apply. And I think they both can be utilized, and it's just a matter of whether you're measuring at the complaint location or whether you're measuring at the source generator. Mike, how many other units are 7DT? Ultimately, it becomes a difference of one. It would okay. be eight. And this is because the traditional field olfactometry methodology when it was developed in 1960 used a dilution ratio of the dilution air divided by the odorous air. And dynamic olfactometry uses a convention of total air divided by odorous air. Trust me, if you do the math, no matter where you are, it's a difference of one. Okay. So seven is eight, 1,000 would be 1,001. So you can quickly see at the low end, it becomes, you know, even at 30 is 30 and 31 really that different. But at very low end, two, three, four, five, there could be a difference if modeling is predicting based on dynamic olfactometry, there may be a difference of one. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mike. Hello. Um, uh, where do you see the older assessment going in the next few years? Say, uh, do you see that governments or environmental agencies will have their own older laboratory or there will be a private laboratories uh, that will be called in like when you need to do a stack sampling? In the U.S.? Yes. In the U.S., I don't see it changing all that much. I do believe that over time, there will continue to be growth in source sampling, as there is now and there always has been, especially the wastewater industry. It's commonplace. It's just what you have to do. It's just part of everything you do. And my second talk has a little bit about that. But I think it's growing in other areas also. And, and uh, so I think it will continue to grow. Um, the majority of action in the U.S. is I, it's proactive. But I say that from the standpoint of a landfill may be proactive because the other landfill they own is in trouble. It, you know, so it, it's, there is more proactivity happening, but it's because of history that they've learned and started to act differently. And so you are seeing um, a growth in understanding that you have to understand the source to then know if changes you make are improving. 